good evening, everyone, if we would make our ways to the, our seats. If you're thankful to be here, why don't we just clap our hands to the Lord and give Him some praise for letting us be able to come together as one into the house of the Lord tonight. better to pray together so let's go into prayer right now there's a lot of a lot of people needing prayer this this evening um, I know my brother-in-law he really needs prayer he just got diagnosed with lung cancer not too long ago and they gave him less than five years to live but I know a God that can heal his body I know a God that can reach down and touch him and take every cancer cell out of his body and I believe it in the name of Jesus. So let's just go together in prayer right now. Lord, we love you, Lord. We're just so thankful to be here tonight, Lord. Lord, we're looking for you to move in a mighty way, Lord. We're just thankful that you let us show up here willing to just be used as a vessel to you tonight, God. Lord, I pray over every need that is in this place tonight. I pray over everybody that is sick, Lord. I just pray that your hand is upon them, oh God. Lord, I just pray that you just heal the ones that needs to be healed, oh God. Lord, just be with us.
believe it. Let's praise him tonight. Let's just raise him up with praise tonight. It says, you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. He is good all the time, church. I'm thankful for him. I'm thankful that he has brought me to a place that is real than any place that I've ever been in my life. I know when I come into the house of the Lord, the Lord's going to meet us here. The Lord's going to give us something that's going to change our mind and our heart, Lord. He is good. He is good all the time. Amen. No place better to be in than the house of the Lord right now. We're going to go into our giving. We got GiveLify. We got PayPal at RiverbendPentecostals.com. Checks and cash. Checks, cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pente Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477 in New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. We got text to give, 833-883-9311. This prayer works. Amen. Let's say it tonight with, with faith, knowing that he is going to move in it. Upon the authority of your word I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaking together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings, and I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. Pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God, perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in and I am blessed going out and all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
ready to have the children come up front. We're going to pray over them. The Lord's going to do mighty things in their life. We need to cover them in prayer every day. If you would, stretch your hand forward tonight and let's pray for these little ones. Lord, we just love you, Lord. We're just so thankful for the opportunity that we have to just pour into these little ones, Lord. I just pray that you protect their hearts and their minds. Lord, I just pray that you just wrap them. And just, Lord, just cover them every day with your blood and with your, with your angels, oh, Lord. I just pray that you lead them in a direction, Lord, that they need to go in, oh, God. I pray that their home is a safe place. I pray that there is no nothing that can block them from the home that you have in those days. And I just pray that you lead them. Violet, that you will lead them back. Let's just stretch our hands forward and just cover them in prayers right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just love you, Lord, and we're thankful. Lord, we just pray that you just place these youth on the path that you, that you lead them on, oh God. Lord, I pray that they can be a witness in their schools, Lord, in their community, oh God. I pray that you can use them in a mighty way, Lord. I just pray that you just protect them, protect their homes, protect their minds, Lord. Just put things in them that is godly, Lord. turn it over to pastor. I know he's got something good for us. Thank you, brother Terrence. Praise the Lord, everybody. Ain't God good? Yep. The Lord is good. Fear of the Lord part nine tonight. I'm thinking perhaps we may wrap this up next week, but we'll see because it's really starting to, uh, sink the plow kind of deep. So uh, I'm glad you're here tonight. Thank you for coming. I, uh, I, we do have several that are sick and, and uh, we need to, need to be praying. And uh, I might remind you that we have Monday night prayer. We have a different focus every Monday night. And it'd really be nice if everybody could at least try to make one out of the month. Pray, prayer has got to be not last on our list, but first. Right. We got to be a praying people, and I hope you're fasting. We haven't talked about it in a while, but uh, we we like to fast at least one day out of the week, and uh, um, that generally means go 24 hours without eating. Uh, and I can tell you, everybody ain't with me that much, uh, but uh, that's all right. If you liked it, it wouldn't be fasting. Amen? It's about getting the flesh under subjection. Thank you, Brother Blake. And so uh, Brother Shannon and Brother Johnny are handing the papers out. And uh, uh, I'd like for you to take a hand out if you could. Uh, you don't have to, but I'd like for you to uh, because uh, when you go home and watch this again, you need something to reference it. Come on, somebody. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully we don't take everything at face value. Study it. Get in the word. Find out if it's true, if it's real. Write some notes down on there. And you remember last week we started. If you have any comments or questions uh, or anything of that nature, we welcome them. But they will be at the end. So write yourself a note, and, uh, and then we'll come back to it. But we also are finding out that many of our questions are being answered as we work our way through. Amen? Amen. I'm assuming we didn't have enough handouts. That's a great problem, but it's embarrassing for me because I am the secretary for Wednesday nights. 
I do the printing and the copying, and I didn't do so good. But let's get in the Word, and then Brother Shannon will be back with some. Uh, the fear of the Lord, I just want to review with you, is reverence, awe, um, amazement. It's recognizing him for who he is, not necessarily for what he does. Can I get an amen in the house? we got to gravitate and move toward God where he is God no matter what he does or doesn't do. Huh? He's still God, and we still trust him, and we still know how great he is and how wonderful he is. And In our last lesson, so, so the, my point is don't, don't mistake the fear of the Lord. It's not, the, it's not we talk about the, uh, the image of the Lord standing over you with a big old hammer waiting to smash you when you do wrong. That's not who he is. That's not who he is. And, don't, and whatever, if, if you have that idea of, of you know, I, I tiptoe through life, afraid I'm going to mess up because God's this big, bad mammy jammy in the sky, uh, lose that idea. That's not what he's like. He's a savior. All right? He loves you. Judgment's coming. We've, we've already established that, but it ain't here right now unless we're going to talk in it tonight, unless you persist in being rebellious and disobedient, God won't take it for long. Amen? Y'all going to connect with me tonight, I hope. In our last lesson, we discussed Paul's warnings to Timothy. Timothy is a young preacher that Paul was raising up of the state and the attitude that will be evident in the church in the last days. Notice I said in the church. We look around in the world to try to get signs of the end time, but this is about the church. All right? And we got to be careful that this ain't us. And if we got any connection with any of this that we see tonight, we need to get somewhere in prayer and ask God to straighten us up. Okay? It's that important. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. That word perilous means dangerous or difficult. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, which means preoccupied with selfishness, covetous, which means more interested in personal gain than anything else, boasters, which <laughs> that word really kind of means blowing smoke. It literally does. But empty boasting, proud, and I, I love this definition I read tonight. It's trying to present yourself as more than God made you. Trying to be something more than God created you to be. Pride. Blasphemers. That means being slanderous. Disobedient to parents. You know what that means. Unthankful. Same thing without gratitude. Unholy. Means to be profane. A profane individual. In the church. I know people are thinking, oh no, but it's here. It's here. Uh, Without natural affection, that means cold, unfeeling, don't have any compassion, you can't be touched by people's calamities or people's situations, truce breakers, unable to be pleased, nothing satisfies you, false accusers, that's lying with the intent to hurt somebody, incontinent is without self-control, fierce, the word definition is savage or not tame. Not You will not fall in the line. You always do your own thing. Despisers of those that are good. Y'all ready for this definition? Haters. It is. I loved it. One word. Haters. The, the world thought they made that up. That's been in the Bible a long time. Traitors, which is betraying. You don't have any loyalty. Heady, which means reckless. High-minded, which is kind of uh, connected to the blowing smoke earlier. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Here we know is how we know it's the church. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power of godliness from such turn away. The New Living Translation says, they will act religious 
but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. A revival of the fear of the Lord is necessary for us to fulfill our obligation to God and to the time such as this that he's put us in. The Lord has put you here and he's empowered you to do what he needs you to do right now. Don't be intimidated by the world that we live in, but by the same token, don't be influenced by the world we live in. God has put us here for a purpose. We cannot have sinners sitting in church without being affected and without feeling the conviction and a desire to change. We cannot become so numbers conscious that we compromise righteousness. We cannot assume we are saved based upon what somebody else told us. We've got to seek out our own salvation with fear and trembling. You do not get saved by joining the church. I know that's a mentality that's in the world, but it's not in the book. When we are infected and diseased with a lack of the fear of the Lord, we can help nobody. When we are infected and diseased with a lack of the fear of the Lord, we can help nobody. And if we're not helping anybody, what exactly are we even doing here? Remember this, Matthew 5 and 13. You are the salt of the earth. Boom, period. You are the salt of the earth. Well, I don't want to be the salt. Too bad. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. What does losing your savor say to us? What does it say to us? You, you all know what salt is. You love it until the doctor tells you you can't have no more. And then you spend all your time standing in the spice aisle trying to find something that looks like salt, tastes like salt, makes you feel like salt, but ain't salt. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Mrs. Dash or something like that. Okay. You're the salt. Salt affects everything it touches. What is the ultimate standard then for being salty? What is the ultimate standard for separation? So the question, and this is found in Matthew 16, 13 through 19, which we will not read all of it, but... It's, it's where Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? The disciples said, some say you're Jeremiah, Elijah, one of the prophets, Jeremiah, so on and so forth. And he said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then the Lord proceeds to tell him that is the rock upon which the church is built, the knowledge, the revelation of who Jesus is, right? So who are we? Who are we in that setting? The church, very good. Now, do you remember a couple of weeks ago I told you the Greek word that that church word right there came from? Does anybody remember? Ecclesia. And what does it mean? Called out. Okay. God's church is not going to be like the rest of the world. By definition, called out. The church, Ecclesia, called out, separated, salty. Huh? Making a difference. What is the church built on? The unmovable rock of the revelation of who Jesus is. Where did that revelation come from? Heaven. Came from God. And what is the evidence of that revelation active in us? The Bible says, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. The church is set. The church is set. Hell will not destroy the church, period. And I will give unto you the keys 
the keys of the kingdom of heaven, what, what's the purpose of a key? Locking or unlocking something. And he said, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So I'm going to give you some keys to unlock some doors, and I'm going to give you some power to do some binding and to do some loosing, to, to do some gathering together, some holding back, and to do some work of revelation or work of deliverance or release. And here's what's happening. When the evidence of the revelation is active in us, heaven and earth are working together. That's what it means to be salty, is to make a difference. To make a difference on this world because that world is working through you. And you are in alignment. To, and hear me when I tell you, you don't want to be nowhere else. I feel Jesus moving in here right now. I do. You don't want to be anywhere else. Heaven and earth are in alignment and we're working together. So what happens when the savor is lost? You ain't helping nobody. You're not making a difference. Now, this just came to me. It's not in my notes. How do we judge whether we're making a difference or not? See somebody changing. Is that how we're supposed to be judging whether we're making a difference or not? No. Why is that? Because we're called to plant and to water and God gives the increase. We plant and we water, but God gives the increase. How's that work for us, Brother Darrell? You put the right seed in, you put the right fertilizer in, you put the right water on it, and then what do you do? Sit back and hope it grows. Because that's not our, you can't go out there and grab them little shoots when they first come up and try to pull them up out of the ground. You'll ruin everything you got. God gives the increase. So how then should we be measuring our effectiveness? Any ideas? I would submit to you that we, me we measure our effectiveness based upon our relationship with him. And that we, God help me right now, that we no longer measure how good he is by what we see him doing but we measure how good he is by how much we know about him. Because God is good when I'm broke and when I'm not so broke. But if we're not careful or when I'm well and I'm not so well, we will judge who, how good he is, Brother Terrence, on our circumstances. And the truth is, here we go, Brother Blake. He may be just wanting to find out how much we do love him. I can't afford to stop believing in him. I can't afford to stop trusting him. Because Peter said, to whom shall we go? I've already got that figured out. Where are you going to go and get what God can do for you? Where are you going to go and get the kind of help the Lord can offer you? Where are you going to go and get the kind of life change that can be found in the presence of the Lord? We can have, ah, come on, Holy Ghost. We can have people start testifying all over this room. The drugs didn't do it. Sex didn't do it. Money didn't do it. Things didn't do it. Houses didn't do it. Trucks didn't do it. Cars didn't do it. Fancy clothes didn't do it. As a matter of fact, ain't nothing ever satisfied you like Jesus. Can I get a witness? Truth is, you know way too much about him to turn around and go back now. But when the savor is lost and we're no longer trying to make a difference, we try to force the evidence that God is in action without submitting ourselves unto him. The biggest trouble that we're having with this series, the reason why we have had a damper on us in many cases with this series is because we don't want to submit to somebody greater than us. It has reared its head up in countless situations. 
We have got to submit ourselves to the Word of God, to the Spirit of God, and the man of God, as long as he lines up with the Word and the Spirit. If I go off out there left field, y'all better get rid of me. But that ain't going to happen. Because I'm falling more and more in love with him. I ain't getting bored with him. Look at what it says in 2 Timothy 4 and 3. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. That's the church. That's not the world. That's the church. That's why many churches, I'm going to mess with this right now. Please don't misunderstand me. That's why many churches have started preaching a social gospel instead of the true gospel. Because we can cover up our shortcomings on the fear of God by getting our name in the paper about how many people we fed and about how many people we put coats on. When the truth of the matter is, you're not really helping nobody unless you empower them to get to a place where they will be fed and be clothed on their own. The reason why our hackles are getting up a little bit right now and the reason why some of us furs getting ruffled up the wrong way is because we kind of like saying, well, I fed them and I gave to them and I did this to them and I did that to them. But Brother Terrence, if nobody's being changed, what exactly are we doing? Why do we want to do that? Listen, God help me right now. We cannot gloss over our ineffectiveness in the world by going and doing more and more and more and more and more. We better get back on our knees somewhere before the Lord and we better find out how we can make a difference in our world. Oh, I be- no, listen, y'all, y'all come too late. I believe in helping the poor. I believe in wisdom in jail. I believe in all of that stuff. Matthew 25 says you won't go to heaven without doing it. I believe it with all of my heart. But I'm telling you, it ain't powerful enough to cover up our lack of saltiness. Some of us don't know what to think about that right now. Because the truth is, in the apostolic church, you can dress right do the right don'ts and do the right do's and it serves the same purpose to disguise our lack of saltiness. Has anybody got a pen? Let me borrow your pen just a second. Yep. You can hear a pen drop. That's the purpose God bless you and thank you for coming to Wednesday night Bible study. But that's why you're here. You're not here to punch a clock and you're not here to get your name on a list and you're not here so you can tell the Lord, I go to Bible study, bless God. You're here because you want to be uncomfortable. You want to be challenged. You want to be drawn into something bigger because you know God called you to something bigger and God's got a bigger plan for you and God's got bigger dreams for you and you don't want to stay like you are anymore. So we try to force it. The message of salvation is designed to lead the one that hears it to change. A life change. When does that life change show up most powerfully in our lives? I'll let you talk this time. When does the evidence that you've been changed show up most powerfully in your life? Maybe. That, that's, oh, what what'd you say, Brother Larry? What'd Jesus do? Uh, what'd Jesus do? What'd Jesus Christ spend most of his time doing? His three and one half years here on the earth, what did he spend most of his time doing? Discipling 12 men to launch out into the world. I can do this all night. I just quit because I know everybody's about to tap out. 
That's the only reason I quit on Wednesdays. But when you take what's happened to you and start pouring it into somebody else, then there's evidence that you're making a difference. Huh? Then there's evidence that you're making a difference. It's designed to lead the hearer to change. You've got to preach a message that you can change. We have got to be preachers of hope. There is no such thing as hopelessness when it comes to God. We got to preach hope. A life change that shows up most powerfully when we're leading someone else down the same path to change that we have already taken. Disciple somebody. It's not enough to just invite people to church. We've already been teaching and showing you and sharing testimonies that you can disciple somebody and they'd be nearby discipled before they ever get here. I don't care if you like that or not. Jesus Christ discipled the 12 disciples for three and one half years and he just spent 40 days with them after the resurrection and they didn't have the Holy Ghost on none of that. Oh, don't you know? Don't you misunderstand me? I believe, and the Bible backs it up. John three and three, John three and five. Except the man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he ain't going to heaven. But I am telling you, you can start making a difference in somebody's life as soon as you meet them. Because brother Larry Jesus did. Oh, come on, I need you to help me right now, Zacchaeus. He never had even seen the Lord. He had only heard about the Lord. But as soon as the Lord stopped under that sycamore tree and said, Zacchaeus called him by name the first time they ever met. He said, boy, you better come down out of that tree. And the Bible says that he came down out of that tree as soon as the Lord, as soon as he got in the presence of the Lord, he started repenting and he started making changes. And he started saying, I want to be different than this because that's why Jesus shows up. He don't show up to give you goosebumps and he don't show up to validate your presence here. He shows up because he wants to change people. Yeah. I didn't get to preach Sunday so I got a little bit of preach on me tonight. You've got to approach every human being you see. We've got to get to a place where we approach every human being we meet uh, boiling over with excitement at the possibilities uh, of when they know him like I know him. Everybody we meet, we've got to view them through the lens of knowing who Jesus is. And there is nobody that he can't change. Do we really believe that? Look at here. My wife, she is a cooking machine. She made hamburger soup today that if you set a bowl of it on top of your head, your tongue would beat your brains out trying to get to it. <laughs> and she made some cornbread in an iron skillet. Woo-wee. I ate three pieces if this is wrong, Lord, forgive me. I ate three pieces with my soup, and then I got me a piece about that long, and I slathered butter on one side of it and grape jelly on the other side of it and smashed it together, and it dripped all over the table while I was eating it. Come on now. But every now and again, it's happened three or four times in our marriage. One time in particular I remember was a pot of white beans. Now, I like them too. Matter of fact, y'all know me. I like it all. But my wife can cook, and it's my, my hope and prayer that I brag on her so much tonight that she cooks meatloaf for me in the next two or three days. Because I told her I get it about once a year, and the anniversary is rolling around. But anyway, this was a big old pot of white beans, and boy, they were pretty. They were pretty. Boy, they, I like my beans cooked down, soupy. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I don't like no hard beans. Boy, these was just a bubbling on top, boy, and they were beautiful. And I ladled me out a bowl of them. Ham, chunks of ham floating in them. But something was wrong. She salted them too much. And she took the first bite, and she said, these are too salty. 
Well, I was going to take a bite because I can usually eat it anyway, Brother Jerry. But I took a bite, and guess what? They were way too salty. Has anybody ever done that before? Say, where's he going with this? You're about to find out. Once something has been touched by salt, you can't undo it. You cannot unsalt something. Matter of fact, the only way you can diminish the effectiveness of the salt is water it down. Ladies and gentlemen, I got to let you know you, were, you are the salt of the earth. The help we are offering is rooted in the awareness of who God is and what he can do because he did it for me. Once something's salted, it can't be unsalted. I don't know if I should tell this or not. If I shouldn't tell it, then I'm going to ask for forgiveness. But last night, Brother Kevin Dawson went into the, to the, to the gas station over there at Parma, and by the time he came out, he had already made a difference in several people's lives, and people were already talking about stuff because once you get salted, you can't unsalt it. And we got to do for nothing else. We got to begin to pray a prayer in this place right now. Lord, I want to make a difference everywhere I go, everybody I meet, everybody I come in contact with, because once you touch them with the Savior that changes lives, it cannot be undone. Am I doing all right, Brother Blake? I feel like I'm doing great. I mean, really, I feel like I'm walking in high cotton as long as my eyes are shut. You cannot unsalt something once it's there. You can't pretend it's not there. We've got to be aware of who he is. And what he can do because he did it for me. And we have to believe we can lead folks to permanent life change through the knowledge of who he is. We have got to stop. Hear me. We've got to stop putting all our eggs in the basket of come to church and your life will be better. I believe it will be better. But we're fixing, we're fixing to unpack some things in just a few minutes. It ain't always better. Matter of fact, Brother Derek, if you tore up from the flow up, it a lot of times going to get worse. Oh, you ain't never heard nobody preach that before. It's always come to our church and your whole life will get better. And then when it don't, they hit the door. But when you get on the wheel, when you get a picture of who he is and how great he is, you get on the wheel and you trust the pressure of those hands to form you and mold you and make you into a vessel worthy of his anointing. I don't know how long since I felt the anointing stronger than I do tonight. The power of the Holy Ghost is in this room. Just because the anointing is evident doesn't mean that those who are anointed are also approved of God. Approval and anointing are not the same thing. Jesus warned us of this, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, when he said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. He that doeth, not everybody that prays, not everybody that claims to be religious is doing the will of God. Obviously. Because many, verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name cast out devils and in your name done many wonderful works? Guess what, Brother Blake? They were telling the truth. They did. They did. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. 
which literally means practicing lawlessness. God did not create me to preach. He didn't create our praise team to sing. He did not give life to us so we could perform miracles. He created us for relationship with him. That's why we're created. And the accurate measure of our relationship with him is our obedience to him. Either he's Lord of everything or he's Lord of nothing. The accurate measurement of our relationship with him is not how he uses us. It ain't how much you talk in tongues. Because after all, he anointed a donkey. He did use a donkey. It's our obedience to him. Look at this. Man, I'm nervous tonight. God told Saul, excuse me, Saul was anointed king of Israel. Nobody dis disputes that, right? He was divinely chosen by God to be Israel's first king. But he couldn't get out of his own way. He thought he knew better than God. God told Saul to go and completely destroy a people called the Amalekites. He was told to slay every one of them, kill all their critters, all their livestock, destroy everything. So he went out and killed all of them, except the king named Agag and what he considered the best of the livestock he brought back. God sent Samuel, go check him. And this is what happened. 1 Samuel 15 and 13. And Samuel came to Saul. Now we know what happens when Samuel shows up, right? Y'all remember? He's the seer. People get afraid. People have high respect for Samuel. Y'all remember that back when he was anointing Jesse's boy and stuff? Samuel comes to Saul and Saul said unto him, please stay with me. This is so important what I'm about to share with you. If you got to go to the bathroom, just hold on to it for a minute. Samuel came to Saul and Saul said unto him, first thing he did is he got religious. Blessed be thou of the Lord. He whooped a blessing on him. And then he said, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. I did what the Lord told me to do. And Samuel said, then what in the world is these sheep bleating I hear and these oxen lowing that I hear? And Saul said, well, they brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord. We're religious. And everything else we utterly destroyed. He said, I did what the Lord told me to do. I destroyed everything except the best and I brought them back for sacrifices. And the king, of course. Then Samuel said unto Saul, stay, and I'll tell you what the Lord has said to me this night. And Saul said, say on. And Samuel said, when thou wast little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a journey and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites. And I don't have time to get into it. But Saul was going to be the hands of God that were prophesied way back when they came out of Egypt. Because the Amalekites caused problems for the children of Israel. And the Lord gave his word, y'all going to be taken out. Saul was going to be the tool God used to take them out. And he disobeyed God. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil? Does anybody understand what that means? Want to share it with us real quick? What's the spoil? The loot. Okay? You saw all these 
good critters, oxygen, oxen and sheep, etc. Oh, Lord. You saw all this stuff and did evil in the sight of the Lord. What happened? Oh, I know he disobeyed God, but why? He got blinded by this stuff. He got blinded by these things that he was seeing. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord because Saul began to see things from a fleshly perspective instead of a godly. God said, kill it all. And Saul saw this good stuff and said to himself, I don't think the Lord understood how good this was when he told me to get rid of all of it. And I see some profitable things here. I see some good sacrifice material here. I, I don't think the Lord understood what he was telling me to do. I'm just going to modify his word a little bit. But look, what, look what he says in verse 20. Give it here. And Saul's, Brother Shannon, when you are deceived, you don't know it. And you know what Saul got deceived by? Two things. And I'm jumping a little ahead. But you know what he got deceived by? What he wanted and what the people wanted. Because look what he says. Yeah, I've obeyed the voice of the Lord. And I've gone the way which the Lord sent me. And I brought Agag the... And that's what I've got to realize. And that's what breaks my heart. It's because I can preach what the Lord gives me. But there are people that are so clouded by pleasing people and by pleasing themselves that they cannot receive what God has given them because it violates what they want. To the point we will declare our own righteousness as truth even when it violates the will and the word of God. Verse 21. But the people took of the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the cheap of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. Now revelation's coming alive in him, but the dumb rascal is passing the buck off on the people to sacrifice unto the Lord. Saul disobeyed God, but in his mind, he not only obeyed God, but he made God's plan better to offer the best to the Lord. Look, he's, really what he's saying is I'm going to kill all of this stuff, but I'm going to wait till I can offer their stuff as a sacrifice to you. Brother Larry, he did not get in his mind that that's what he was doing when he obeyed God in the first place. He changed it and he, God, I feel the Holy Ghost, but I feel something else moving in here too. He modified God's plan to suit what he wanted, what it made him look like in what it fed of the ego of the people. He planned to kill it all along, but he was going to do it on his time. And Samuel said, verse 22, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken, y'all know what that means? Listen, than the fat of the rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So rebellion is basically worshiping the devil and stubbornness is worshiping me. Look here. Because thou hast rejected the word of God, he also hath rejected thee from being king. Saul was anointed, but he was rebellious and stubborn and he couldn't maintain who he was supposed to be in God with rebelliousness and stubbornness governing his life. Remember, when you were little in your own sight, 
the Lord anointed you. But now what has changed? I've already shared with you. The people wanted it. And you know what Saul, you know what Saul came up with? A plan that in his mind satisfied the people and God. The fear of the Lord was not the motivation behind his actions. Two things took precedence, pleasing himself and pleasing people. I'm talking about the fear of the Lord tonight. We're going to bring it home. The Jews, if you're reading the bread, you just came through this or you're reading it now, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. The Jews had to endure a prophetically declared exile into Babylon. Anybody remember how long they were going to have to stay there? Seventy years. But then God turned it around. Woo-wee. You read about the deliverance. I think it's Psalms 126 that said, when the Lord turned again our captivity, we were like them that dream. It was like a dream come true. God turned it around. Please stay with me. A lot of moving around, a lot of stuff going on, but you got to stay with me tonight. This is so important for us. They went to Babylon. Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. They burned it all down. Y'all remember reading that? But God turned it around. They were released to go back to Jerusalem and build the temple, rebuild the temple. And they did it with great excitement. They went back and they went to work. But it wasn't long until they lost their focus. This has been magnified in my mind. You can't afford to get distracted in your walk with God. I've got to tell you that tonight. And all of your distractions do not show up on your doorstep holding up a sign that says, just want to let you know I'm a distraction. They're not, there's nobody out there blowing a trumpet that says, just want to announce the distractions coming. But they're here right now. So, God delivered his people from Babylonian captivity and they go back to Jerusalem and they, and they have the, uh, the, the, the king behind them. They're given the right to build, rebuild, but they lost their focus and they stopped working on the house of the Lord and began to spend most of their time, talent, and treasure on things for themselves, including houses and lands and whatever the case may be, but they, in doing so, they neglected the house of God. And their overall attitude came to be one of discontent and drudgery. I believe I read that it was 16 years they were trying to get started working on the house of God, but they couldn't get anywhere because they spent all their time working on their stuff. The overall attitude came to be one of discontent and drudgery. Why is that? Why do you think that is? I've already preached it to you. Why do you think it is they spent all their time and effort on stuff for themselves, but it didn't accomplish what they wanted it to? Why is that? Because the things I do for me don't last. The things I do that I want to do, they don't last. That's why you can go out to the club and fall in love and wake up in the morning wondering, what have I done? And then you go do it again. Then you go do it again. Then you go do it again. People do all sorts of things. Why do you think people, think about this, jump out of airplanes for fun? But, I mean, really, I'm, I'm not damning and condemning it. I wish I had the nerve to do it. Bungee jumping and all that, that's not my point. The point is, is we are continually chasing something. But it never lasts. Think about the feeling when you drive up in your driveway the first time with that new ride. You've got to go through town first. You know good and well you got to cock that seat just a little bit. 
hit that system just a little bit. Why? I want everybody to look at me and my new ride. A month later, two months later, sure enough, a year later, guess where you go, go to take your wife out to eat at Cape? You got to drive through the car lot first. Just want to see what's news out there. It's true. I've done it. Because there's nothing in this world that satisfies you. Nothing. That's why the attitude of these people, boy, they came back. You can read it in the Bible. Boy, they were dancing. They were playing music. They were rejoicing. They were shouting. We're the ones going to make a difference. God turned it around. The next thing you know, there's just a foundation, part of a foundation out there, and their houses are being raised up. But they were discontented. And here's what the Lord told them. Haggai 1 and 9 in the New Living Translation. He said, you hoped for rich harvest. Boy, let me tell you about this new deal I got. We're going to get rich from it. I got this new thing going. We're going to be loaded when we come out of it. Man, I, I, I know we got revival, but I can't come but one night because I got a deal going. But when it comes going, boy, I'm going to be a blessing to the church like they ain't never seen. That's, that's what he's t saying right there. When you started working on yourself, when you started focusing on yourself, you had big plans. But it didn't work out like you thought it would. Why? Because God gives the increase. And when you did bring your harvest home, I blew on it. You ever put some husk and blow on them and it just scatters? And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Why did I do that? Because my house got neglected. Oh, man. Y'all don't think for one second that I'm talking about this church house, do you? You're the temple of God. And when you work on being a dwelling place for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, it ain't never going to work. You cannot put all your efforts and your energy in satisfying you with this. I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruin, says the Lord of heaven's armies, while all of you are busy building your own fine houses. It is because of you that the heavens withhold the dew and the earth produces no crops. Now Malachi expounds on this a little bit more, just right before the close of the Old Testament, and then there was going to be 400 years of silence from heaven. The prophet Malachi offered this critique of the relationship between God and his people. Verse number 6 of chapter 1. The Lord of heaven's army says to the priest, A son honors his father and a servant respects his master. If I am your father and master, where are the honor and the respect I deserve? That's the Lord talking. You give respect and honor to others. Where's mine? You have shown contempt for my name. Now, I want you to see this. But you say, how did we ever show contempt for your name? What are you talking about, Lord? You got us messed up. You got us, we, we didn't do that. Next verse. You have shown, God help me. Oh, Lord. You have shown contempt by offering defiled sacrifices on my altar. Does anybody want to just tell us real quick cliff notes of why that's a problem? What did the Lord say the offerings to him got to be? We know that. How far back do we know that? Cain and Abel. Cain brought an offering, but Abel brought the first fruits and the fat thereof. The best of the best has to belong to the Lord. We're talking about two houses here. There's a house of the world and a house of the Lord. Right? Then you said, how have we defiled the sacrifices? 
You defile them by saying the altar of the Lord deserves no respect. Next verse. When you give blind animals as sacrifices, isn't that wrong? And isn't it wrong to offer animals that are crippled and diseased? So what they were doing, can anybody see the picture here of what they're doing? What they doing, Brother Shannon? Bringing the scraps. The, oh, Brother Larry. They're bringing to the Lord what they can't use. Y'all feel that in this room right now? They're bringing to the Lord the leftovers, the scraps, the sacrifices, Brother Blake, that, that only have one leg or, or, or have a leg missing or blind or, or got some kind of disease on them. They, they're bringing the ones that don't profit them anything. Matter of fact, they were going to kill them anyway. So now they brought them to the Lord. But they're all bringing them to the Lord. God have mercy. They're all bringing them to the Lord and they've got this big altar up here and they all put that stuff on the altar and they light it in fire and they all clap and they dance like they did something. And now they're asking the Lord, what's the deal? What's wrong? And the Lord said, you're not giving me anything close to the best. Matter of fact, you're giving me the least that you have. Try giving gifts like that to your governor and see how pleased he is, says the Lord of heaven's armies. They had a religious life. They were still going to church, for goodness sake. They were still bringing an offering. But they were giving God the leftovers, the animals that had something wrong with them. They weren't profitable for them, so they gave them to God. And just as Saul's attitude deluded him, he was deceived into, he really thought he did right. They're really telling the Lord, living in a place of self-justification and deception, which will always end up being the same place. When we begin to try to justify ourselves, when it conflicts with the word of God, we will always end up living in a place of deception. And they say, I know your kids have done it before. Here's what they said to the Lord. What did we do? We tried. I mean, really. Do y'all see that? They're like, how did we do anything wrong? Oh, God, I need you to help me right now. Holy Ghost is ministering in this house. And he's making us a little uncomfortable. But that's what we want. That's why you're here. Proverbs 3 and 9 says, Honor the Lord. Oh, I'm going to do a little bit of preaching and then we're going to roll out of here. <laughs> Honor the Lord with thy substance. That's what you already have that you have acquired justly. It is very clear that you're not supposed to be bringing an offering that you hoodooed somebody out of. Something shady, something fake, something less than. It's kind of like you find a bag of money on the floor and you say, I wonder what I ought to do with that. I know what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to keep it. In case the Lord gets mad, I'm going to give 100 to the church. You feel me? Yeah. Honor the Lord with thy substance, that which you already have and have gotten justly, that with which you already are. And with the first fruits of all thine increase, which is that which you're going to get. But the Lord gets the best. I said the Lord gets the best of you and your stuff. Listen to what this word honor means. I hope to goodness, I hope to goodness this messes with you like it messed with me. Here's what honor means. And Enviable esteem. Meaning that everything else in my life should be jealous of how much the Lord means to me. Amen. Come on, Brother Bill. That's right. Amen. 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 
Ooh, I feel Jesus in this place right now. People, places, things, spirits, and ideas should all want what I'm giving to him. Not the other way around. He should not have to look at my life and wish that I gave him what I give to them. If we're giving him less than our best, then we are deficient in our awareness of who he is. We are deficient in the fear of the Lord. If we're giving him less than our best, we're in a dangerous place. And I wrap it up with this. The call of this series is evaluation. Does my life reflect his standing in it? Does God, in fact, hold a unique place in my life? And does everything else in my life wish that they receive the honor he receives? Brother Kevin, this better be good. You didn't leave it in the hands of God. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. As many as are led by the Spirit of God or the sons of God, or let's see, I'm getting too spurs. It, it means be led by faith, not by sight, by spirit, and not by flesh. That flesh that leads me is not always my flesh. Sometimes it's other people's flesh. That's what you're asking? Yes. Oh, I don't know if you got time for all of that. Because in the mind of them shysters bringing crooked gifts, deformed gifts, messed up gifts, they had convinced themselves they were doing God a solid. If it makes you better in living for God, if it makes you more faithful, if it makes you more consecrated, more dedicated, and you lay your head down and you can sleep peacefully, you're probably doing all right. But if you have to live every second of your life regretting and weighing, well, should I do that or should I do that? You need to throw that blessing in the trash and you need to tell the Lord, I'm here, I'm yours. That's what you need is me. Does that make sense? A distraction is anything that gets you if get, get you away from the house of God, get you away from the people of God, get you away from doing what you need to do for God. If it ain't making you better, it's a distraction. Is that fair? Any other comments or questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Some cases, both. I want to be restricted from doing my own way and doing my own thing. That's the, I have bound myself. Paul said, for instance, they told him, he said, if you're going to go to Jerusalem, they're going to mess you up there. And he said, you don't understand. I'm going to Jerusalem bound in the spirit, meaning God has put something on me that I can't shake loose from. Binding and loosening. Matthew 16, yeah, whatever you bind on earth, that, that's exactly what I'm talking about. You Remember they said the, the way that is going to lead to salvation is what? Straight and narrow, okay? It's, it's, there are some things I can't do if I want to be pleasing to God. There are some things that I can't be a part of if I want to be pleasing to God. There are some places I can't go if I want to be pleasing to God. So I have bound myself to the word of God and heaven backs me up. Or loosed. 
It's, it's not really an either or. It denotes power and authority and ability. The one doing the binding or the one doing the loosen means my life is surrendered to the Lord. If he wants to bind me, I want to be bound. If he wants to loose me, I want to be loosed. I mean, does that make sense at all? All right, well, tell me. Tell, that's all right. It's, it's, you can't get caught up in what, what do you see as binding? Okay, that's, that's the problem. It's not talking about that necessarily, though the principle is the same. All right, remember Paul said, I'm going bound in the spirit into Jerusalem, meaning God has put something on me that I can't get away from, and I'm willing to submit my life to it. Okay, but, but he's also going loosed in the ability to do that. Okay, binding and loosening means my life is subject to whatever heaven wants, and now as I do it, I'm in alignment with heaven. We talk about it a little bit later if you need to, but it's, it's, it's about whose authority and whose power am I under. All right, who's ordering and dictating my life, me or God? And when I come into alignment, if it's me, it better be in alignment with him. Because now I've stepped off. Is that all right? Okay, anybody else? Anybody else? Stand with me. Thank you for coming. We can discuss that again. Maybe we'll run into one another on the golf course again. And we can discuss. By the way, this ain't church thing, but I parred the next three holes after you gave me them balls. So I don't know if I can see them better, but I hit them straighter. So... She saw me on the golf course, and I was hitting pink balls, and I think it upset her. So she gave me some yellow ones instead. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> she felt sorry for me, so she gave me part of her stash. I don't know if I was supposed to have told that or not, but I did. Yeah. Anyway, what do you think about the Lord? Huh? I got to be saved. I got to make it. I have to hear him say, well done. Lord, I love you tonight. Thank you for your goodness and mercy, your grace, your kindness. Thankful for your word. Thankful for the places that you're trying to take us in your word, and who you want us to be. I'm thankful, Lord, that you uh, have ministered in this place tonight. I feel your anointing and I feel your unction. I feel your direction in this place. I pray, God, that you'll help everybody to, to evaluate themselves and to come into alignment with you, I give you praise, honor, and glory for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget about church, 10 o'clock Sunday morning, 11 o'clock worship. Be there, be square.